I think we'll get started. And thanks everybody for coming out today. This is a great crowd and I'm really happy to see you all. I appreciate it. Um, before we get started, just a little housekeeping. If you wouldn't mind turning off your um, cell phones so that they don't ring in the middle and disrupt everything, I'd appreciate that. And you know the bathrooms are downstairs and to the left. And we have a couple more programs coming up in December. Um, this is next Thursday at 2.30 instead of two. And this is Veronica Marino. Uh, she had the pizza mm -hmm. place here in La Vida and works at Charlie's now. And uh, once, um, some years ago, she just decided she wanted to just take out to sea. So she just kind of sold everything and uh, spent a year sailing uh, on, a, on a replica of an old 1800-style singer. So she's going to talk about some of her adventures doing that. And then Joelle Matthews from La Vida has brought this documentary to us. And she said this is really a great documentary about how, you know, the earth is running out of topsoil. And uh, we've only got about 60 years left of that. And these are some problems and some solutions of what maybe we can do now to, to help offset that problem. And this is an, a, really an award-winning documentary. And that will be in two weeks on Thursday, and she wanted to have it at five o'clock instead of two, so that other people might be able to view it who, you know, who have a nine to five job or something. So anyway, look on our website and in the paper, and you'll see these two things, and then we'll have Christmas, and then we'll start over in January, okay? But today, we're really happy to have Dr. Norberto Valdez, and he's gonna talk to us about some interesting cultural identity stuff that she that he has discovered and found, and uh, well, I'm just going to let him tell us what he wants to talk about. But I think I think you all know, and that's why you're here. That we're in for a treat today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. I want to thank the library for giving us the space uh, to have these kinds of. Uh, should we call them performances? <laughs> yeah. And uh, also to the Heritage Foundation, which I'm a board member. We organize a few things uh, here in La Vida and try to uh, uh, stimulate thought and discussion and maybe afford an opportunity for buying presents and things like that for your friends and family. So uh, thank you very much for, for coming. It's great to see people who are interested in history, and uh, particularly in this case, the history of native and so-called Hispano uh, uh, families. Um, the question, of course, that comes up in um, a discussion uh, uh, such as this um, is, where did it all come from? Why do we have what we have today? What, have, what are the implications of history? Um, <clears throat> so, um, let me start out with just a personal note of how I got interested in this topic of any sort of history and culture and identity. Uh, I am an anthropologist by training and um, uh, my training in anthropology has been uh, trying to understand the nature of small-scale, free capitalist kinds of societies. And more importantly, how they have changed over time, especially as they have been affected by capitalist market practices. So um, the academic part also comes in because I have had graduate students when I taught at CSU. Fort Collins, two of my graduate students uh, took as their topic, without my goading or anything, introduction, uh, the issue of any sort of identity. Uh, one of them is from New Mexico, Leroy Saiz. He did his master's degree uh, on that topic. And the other person is David Young, who some of you have, may have met him if you have been to the ceremonies over here at Libre near Gardner. In the, in the springtime. 
So um, uh, the academic part uh, is, of course, an important part of my life, in which a lot of the bigger questions of life and social and cultural change around the world, that's where it all stems from. At the personal level, um, <clears throat> my wife and I, Jan, has um, been uh, doing a lot of research on genealogical questions, both in her family, and she has done a lot to help me understand my own family, because she's a, a lot more adept at doing this kind of research. And with the recent advances in DNA research, um, I've come to appreciate these new analyses of the genetic contributions that past generations have bequeathed upon the present ones. And so I've always held this idea of uh, Chicanismo, which is an identity related to Mexican Americans. It's a political aspect, focused basically on political <coughs> aspects of, uh, of who Mexican Americans are. And um, so I've always had this curiosity about my own indigeneity, what my indigenous background is, because Chicanismo, and I taught Chicano studies at CSU along with Native American histories, um, uh, focuses upon the Indian background, unlike uh, what some authors have referred to uh, regarding identity formation in New Mexico, especially northern New Mexico, but it's had its impacts here in southern Colorado, and that is the myth of Spanish uh, ancestry. Uh, there are many that come from that area, whose families come from the area of northern New Mexico, particularly the Rio Arriba <coughs> County, uh, the region of the upper Rio Grande River. And uh, um, also, their impact here in Southern Colorado, as I said, has been profound. So even in my own family, when we talk about uh, ancestry, ethnicity, family background, we uh, commonly hear, oh, those are my Spanish roots, or uh, mainly focusing on the Spanish. Chicanismo is another kind of thinking that focuses on the Indian reality, what the politics and history is of where people like a group called Mexican-Americans, or Mexicanos as we refer to ourselves in Spanish, uh, where, where that came from, what it's all about. Um, so uh, the personal part uh, uh, has stirred my interest in this topic because uh, now with DNA uh, advances uh, and, and analyses, um, I've come to see that a lot of what I had suspected has now been confirmed by um, some of the, the data. Um, we recently did various uh, DNA samples from family members, and it seems that we're much more Indian than we thought we were. <laughs> uh, so I'm almost half. So people say, well, where are you enrolled? <laughs> well, it brings up the question, are you Hispanic or Hispano, as we say in New Mexico, or are you Indian, right? Where's your land base? Well, the history of the Henisaro, as with the history of the Chicano people, uh, reveals that. Why there is no land base, or hasn't been a land base, at least for some of us. Um, we acquired land through the colonial process, and also through entrepreneurial activities, such as my grandparents, who were large landowners right here in this county uh, years ago. So um, it's a very personal thing for me. It's not just an academic thing. And the other thing is the political. Um, uh, I uh, am a veteran of the Vietnam War. Uh, I should say the US wars against Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. It was three countries where over a million people were killed. And I have to, of course, uh, evaluate my own willingness. Actually, I volunteered. I wasn't drafted. So uh, I'm interested in combining some of my anthropological interests with uh, why, why the third world, why it gets nailed through imperialistic wars that uh, oftentimes are unjust wars. <clears throat> so it's led me down the path of activism, political activism, 
uh, in defense of indigenous peoples. And uh, now that I uh, understand a little bit more about my own family background, um, it's, it's hard in that, that commitment that I have in, in a political sense. <laughs> the purpose and the goals are sweet. Uh, yeah, um, and let's just quickly uh, point it out so we don't spend too much time on this, uh, uh, just this outline. I want to explain a little bit about the origins and the history of the Henisaro phenomenon. Um, I'm not an expert in this, this area. It's come out of my own uh, interest that I just previously mentioned. Um, uh, and uh, I'm just giving you an outline, and hopefully it'll stir up some questions in your own mind that we can talk about at the end of the discussion, um, or maybe you can do some own, your own research. I'll cite a few um, sources that might be useful for you to understand where any set of people came from. The other thing is how conquest and colonization are a fundamental aspect of this history, if we are to understand uh, the life ways that evolved and the formation of a new identity. So in anthropology, we call it uh, ethnogenesis. It's a new, it's a creation of a new ethnic identity through the melding of different peoples from different worlds. And then the last thing is to raise questions about the current Henisado phenomena. There's kind of a renaissance, shall we call it, of uh, Henisado identity uh, in northern New Mexico. And uh, that's where it originated back in the uh, 1700s and 1600s also, uh, but also here in, in Colorado, as I mentioned with some, just two of my students uh, that are very personal to me, uh, are raising questions about their own identities and trying to understand uh, these questions that we will again raise at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> Okay, who, uh, what is a, a Henisa, right? Henisa, where does the word come from? That's a Spanish word, but via the Italian language and also going back to uh, the Turkish language during the time of the Ottoman sultans. Uh, the, another word that's associated with uh, the word Henisa is Janissary, J-A-N-I-S-S-A-R-Y, Janissary. The Janissary, which is not the word the Turks use, by the way, uh, is a class of people uh, foreign to the uh, uh, Turkish society that were recruited as military people. There was actually an entire, I don't know if you want to call it class or a caste of people, of men, who were recruited to be the military protectors of the Sultanate. So uh, <clears throat> uh, these sometimes were <laughs> Eunuch, eunuchs, uh, castrated folks, <coughs> so they could focus upon their their military duties and not be distracted by other things. So um, yeah, so uh, the Henisado, thats where the the concept came from. Um, and here in the Southwest, what it refers to is captured native people. Uh, during the time of uh, of the formation of this country. Um, <clears throat> uh, there were different worlds that were converging in what is now the United States. The Spanish were not only here in the Southwest, they, were, they also came up through the Caribbean. La Florida, the state of Florida, was settled by the Spanish. The Spanish left their footprints all the way up to Maryland. There's a little town called St. Mary's up there, where that was formed by the, the Spanish during the early 1600s. So uh, their footprints were there as the uh, English began to enter into the area of Virginia and up into the northeast of the United, which is now the United States. <clears throat> the French were coming in through the northern part of the country. What were they mainly uh, doing? Well, it was mainly engaging in trade and commerce. They have huge impacts here in combination with the Spanish who were coming up from the east and the south. And so horses came in through this direction and mainly guns came in from the other. That was a deadly combination for some, but it was also a very advantageous uh, aspect of early native uh, life as this 
part of the country, uh, part of the world was being settled. So uh, <clears throat> the raiding and trading began to take place as competition for resources became increasingly important. Now, this raiding and trading, as I'll mention in a moment, uh, is a global thing. It's not just a matter of uh, the Camino Real, which came from, New Mex from uh, Mexico City up to this region, and it was not just a matter of the Santa Fe Trail, which came from Missouri to Santa Fe. So uh, it involved all of these different countries, like France and Spain and England, and uh, other the, uh, markets that these other countries that were colonizing this region had trade relations with. So it's a global thing. This is where I think anthropological knowledge about uh, things global, global networks, trade, uh, and all of the consequences of that, the rise of capitalist markets uh, had a tremendous impact all over the world. And this is no exception. We often think of these little villages in northern New Mexico as isolated and never changing, but the dynamics is tremendous. And this is what resulted in this new phenomenon called the Henry Settle. <clears throat> so, as a direct result of the trading, raiding became so important because of these trade routes and the ties that native people had in the areas where they were losing access to their lands. The Comanche, for instance, were not part of the so-called horse culture of the plains. They originated in northern Utah as well as southern Wyoming. These are Shoshonean-speaking peoples with a larger uh, linguistic context of Utah Aztecan languages. Uh, and uh, they were hunters and gatherers on foot. But when they got access to horses, they became what some historians have called the scourge of the plains. They became, their adaptational abilities were tremendous, and they became rulers of the plains from southern uh, Wyoming, the Dakotas, all the way down into Mexico, currently Mexico, Chihuahua. So uh, that uh, <clears throat> those kinds of changes, cultural changes, access to horses and guns, uh, led to raiding of various kinds of communities among the Plains Indians themselves. The main groups being the Comanche, the Apache, the, and their cousins, the Navajo, uh, the Utes. And other, uh, and partly the Pueblos as well, even though they were settled uh, or sedentary agricultural uh, communities, uh, they, those kinds of populations typically become the targets of nomadic groups. Why? Because they have resources stored up for the next year, whereas nomadic peoples have to go looking for things, right? To eat and build their homes or whatever, uh, clothe themselves. So um, <clears throat> this instigated. Um, raiding from among these different groups. So this is where the theft, uh, the capture of women and children uh, mainly, but also men because there's heavy work to be done in the fields and what all. So this led to a, a, a surge in the, in the raiding that took place uh, where uh, it had taken place at a lower level in previous uh, decades. So uh, with the uh, trading um, native people typically in the Plains areas had the, what the French call rendezvous in the springtime. They would have these trade fairs where they would trade their goods and uh, uh, there was a time for uh, choosing wives as well and uh, husbands. So uh, a lot was happening then. Uh, they, uh, the need for labor uh, caused um, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, increase in that raiding and trading as uh, communities began to grow uh, in the region. So the Henisaro became and uh, came as a result of the raiding uh, and that trading. Uh, it resulted in a, uh, the, the capture of individuals from native tribes and traded into uh, institutions <coughs> such as the Catholic missions, uh, domestic homes uh, and uh, uh, 
field labor uh, as needed. So they are enslaved and they're detribalized. They were taken out of the context of their homes and their families and forcibly sold into slavery. So a process of uh, detribalization took place uh, and of course total domination of a slave typically had its psychological and mental impacts as <coughs> many of our uh, psychologists have uh, revealed uh, in their analysis <coughs> uh, of uh, enslavement. So colonization is a big part of that and the Hispanicization, speaking of Spanish and the conversion to uh, Catholicism um, um, and other uh, practices that were part of the Hispano communities that existed. <clears throat> uh, a, an author by the name of Thomas Hall in his book called Social Change in the Southwest uh, refers to the dynamics of raiding and trading in this huge region that extended at times all the way up to, the, to California with the raiding of communities uh, from that region as well as along the plains in New Mexico and as far north as uh, the, the Dakotas. But it was mainly focused in this region of New Mexico uh, and southern Colorado. Uh, <clears throat> so as I said before, the um, need for labor, the expanding trade along these two major trade routes, as well as the increasing competition for resources. As resources were dwindling, uh, more and more competition uh, resulted as people needed to get into new lands uh, that were already inhabited. So this led uh, to uh, many of the conflicts between and among these groups that I already mentioned. So uh, this whole process of, um, of the uh, Spanish uh, colonizing the Southwest and needing to dominate for the benefit of the Spanish crown, they needed to encourage people to inhabit and colonize areas of the Southwest. And this was particularly difficult uh, when the centers of power were as far south as Mexico City, uh, 17, 1800 miles. And so um, there was a need to have uh, populations, local populations that knew something about the area in which they lived and helped to colonize the periphery. Uh, that, of course, was for the protection of the Spanish uh, against encroachments by other Europeans who were uh, entering into the area as well, the French and particularly uh, the English, who Spain had had previous wars with, <coughs> did not trust them. So the other thing was they needed to form these communities in order to uh, purposely undermine the semi-feudal context in which the northern periphery of New Spain had been ensconced. So uh, the feudal hacienda system was, as it was practiced in other parts of the Americas, fomented by the Spanish, was a creation of huge haciendas with labor under the encomienda system that would give free labor access with servile uh, labor uh, being used to make the haciendas grow. The semi-feudal character was that these haciendas were very internally uh, focused on the dynamic of the hacendado, who was the owner of the hacienda. Well, owner in, in parentheses because the crown did not give uh, private property to hacienda owners. He gave them encomiendas. Encomienda is not a land grant. An encomienda is a, a grant of labor, free labor of, of, and control of the people who lived on the land that had been given in possession, not, not uh, uh, private property like fee simple, right, that we know so much about under capitalism. So um, they tried to understand that, and the land grant system that is so widespread in uh, New Mexico, as well as here in southern Colorado, that uh, was a purposeful effort to undermine that semi feudal character of Spanish uh, uh, incursions into this part of the world. 
The last thing was that um, there are Catholic missions that were given tremendous power <coughs> to colonize and to Christianize uh, Indian populations. <clears throat> so these communities became the means by which the Spanish and later the Mexican government would encourage the formation of communities on the frontier strategically so that they could protect the missions and the mission interests. But they would also protect some of the Hispano communities that were not uh, closely tied to the Indian communities. Okay, I want to give an example of uh, the families and subsequent generations of a man by the name of Hernan Martin Serrano, who was very influential, uh, his generations, I should say, were influential in the Chama Valley of Rio Arriba area of New Mexico. Uh, Hernan Martin Serrano, and there were three of them in the different generations. Uh, the original one was a, a conquistador. He came with Juan de Oñate, who was the main Spanish colonizer that founded uh, the first colonizing effort in New Mexico, settling in the area of Santa Fe in New Mexico. Uh, this uh, Martin Serrano was a soldier with that expedition, arriving in 1598, and uh, uh, he uh, proceeded to expand his influence uh, over uh, the region. Subsequent generations moved into strategic areas, river valleys in particular, one of them being the Chama Valley, which comes, uh, Chama River comes uh, through uh, northwestern, uh, north central, northwestern New Mexico and flows at a southeasterly direction toward Santa Fe. Uh, that valley is, is a beautiful valley uh, and uh, the agricultural potential was very quickly realized. And so uh, the, uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, offspring of uh, Martin Serrano, uh, Hernan, two generations of them, and uh, uh, Luis and others uh, began to uh, organize Hanisaro villages, uh, such as Abiquiu, El Rito, Caliente La Madera, Placitas, Las Tablas, and as far south as uh, Belen, and uh, I think there's another couple of communities that are also any set of communities further south. So, um, this person is the progenitor, uh, the, uh, a principal ancestor of many, many people whose ancestors come out of that Chama Valley, that Santa Fe area and Taos area of New Mexico. Uh, this man and his uh, uh, offspring were the folks who organized a lot of these fairs that we love to go to uh, these days, uh, where you buy lots of arts and crafts, right, Sandy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, as with the earlier rendezvous, these trade fairs were also for the purpose of uh, trading people. So people would be bought um, out of the captivity that they had just been experiencing and sold to the missions or to particular families, private families, who could afford to buy them. So uh, sometimes people raise the question, well, they, were they slaves or not? Well, they weren't chattel slavery as blacks were in, in the South uh, because they could experience some degree of social mobility they actually became part of families at times and married into the uh, Hispano families that bought them out of, out of their captivity. So um, uh, Martin Serrano, because of that tremendous influence in the Rio Arriba area of northern New Mexico, um, actually became the, the originator of the name, last name Martinez. Martinez actually came from the name Martin. Uh, in Spanish, if you refer to uh, the families that are the Martinez's, well, you, they refer to them as Los Martinez, and it came to stick as the name. And now the, the proliferation of Martinez is all over the Southwest and probably around the world. Uh, it's a joke that Father Martinez 
was the, the father of a lot of <laughs> Martinez's around <laughs> the United States, but uh, they do go back to Hernan Martin Serrano in terms of genetic affiliation. Something like 60% of the people who claim uh, ascendancy uh, or descendancy to, uh, to the Chalam Valley can trace their ancestors to this man. 60%. Okay, now if uh, these um, communities were being used as buffer zones in isolated areas where they would be subjected to almost constant attacks by nomadic tribes who were in search of captives to put into the trade markets, why would they go there? Well, remember that they had also been enslaved under the Spanish system, totally dominated, uh, removed of their capacity to own land. Ironically, it was their land to begin with, but uh, that's the nature of conquest, right, and colonization. So uh, to escape that domination and servitude, uh, many people took the chance, I guess we can call it, to uh, go into isolated areas so that they could have access to land and also to economic opportunity. This is where the land grant system became so important. Land was not given in fee simple. It was not private property. It was under the what's called the ejido system, E-J-I-D-O. The ejido system is a communal form of property in which the uh, inhabitants of that property have access. They're given access through a uh, uh, through a, a system controlled by influential people who had originally petitioned for that land. Twenty or more families were expected to uh, settle the land in return for access to that land. The land is communal land, so they could not sell it. It tied them to the land because if, you, if they were to uh, not produce on that land for two years, it would, could be taken from them and reassigned to somebody else. So the ejido system is kind of like the old hacienda system, in a sense that it tied people to the land. Isn't that the uh, grand irony for native people? <laughs> Tying people to the land. Now the issue of land and sovereignty is such an important aspect of native life everywhere. So, uh, in terms of identity of the Hanisaro population, uh, are they really an ethnic, racial, or cultural group? Are they, is there any distinctness to them whereby they could claim some kind of nationhood, I guess we could call it, right? Nationhood is based on, upon culture and life experiences. Well, if we look at the 1790 census results, one-third of the entire population of New Mexico was determined to be any sub. They are mestizos, a mixture of Spanish and native. Um, so it's a significant part of that population, of that region. Uh, very few New Mexico inhabitants could claim significant degrees of Spanish ancestry. This is important because to this very day, there's this ongoing myth as uh, Rodolfo Acuna in his book, Occupied America, states it's a myth of Spanish, it's the fantasy and myth of Spanish ancestry. I have cousins right here in this county that I've talked to about our family uh, ancestry, and one of them said to me, you can call me anything you want, but don't you dare call me Mexican. <laughs> yeah. So there's this antipathy uh, about Mexicanness that has been grilled into, I would say, by historical racism experienced in the Southwest that leads to thoughts like that. I had no response for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, the cultural practices that we see among so-called uh, Henisano populations in New Mexico, and now they're, they're spreading out into Southern Colorado as well, uh, are uh, a syncretism of the life ways that uh, were, uh, the native people were assimilated in, into under the Spanish, uh, but also they retained as many 
dominated populations or enslaved populations do, they retain some of their uh, the originality of who they are as a people, right? Back up one. Okay. Now there's a word that um, some of you may know or not know. Manito. <laughs> I see Anna Jo smiling. She knows what that means. Manito is a term that comes out of northern New Mexico, right from where my family comes from. Uh, Manito comes as a, as a minute, uh, minimization of the word hermano. Hermano is brother, right? Uh, hermanito or manito it comes from that word. Uh, manita. Uh, there's a, a Sarah Deutsch in her book on regional uh, identities in the Southwest talks about the regional characteristic of the populations that migrated out of northern New Mexico into other regions of, uh, of um, the Southwest. When I first went to live in Fort Collins, having gotten a job there, um, part of the barrio in the northern north side of Fort Collins is made up of manitos. And there's that identity, you know, you, as soon as you find out, probably just listening to an accent, <laughs> like, safe ways <laughs> or other uh, anglicisms or Spanish words that uh, are have a new twist on it because of linguistic change uh, you recognize in each other and you, you have that sense that well these are my gente these are my people right word raza that doesn't mean race it means people right so uh, yeah, this is um, uh, the nature of that regional identity that is <coughs> symbolized in that word, Manito. So Manito villages are all those villages that you see mainly in the area of Rio Arriba County today in New Mexico. What's important about all this uh, uh, is that there's the communal, communalism that characterizes <coughs> these villages that are based on the ejido, but also on the uh, communalism of indigenous communities in which they were close, in close contact, but also from which they had originated, right? So um, uh, the land grants, of course, are the basis of the identity because of the life ways that they led uh, in an isolated peripheral area of the Southwest. So the Ejido had its different aspects. They had the, the Vega, uh, which were the areas near where the homes were built, uh, with their garden plots, but also they had access, everybody had equal access to mountain regions where they could get firewood, uh, lumber for building their homes, uh, and uh, uh, whatever else was needed to carry out their daily uh, lives. Uh, communal institutions, uh, we see this very commonly among uh, native populations. Um, <clears throat> communal labor, uh, mutual aid societies, the penitente religion, all of these institutions reflect some of that communalism that was so much a part of native lifeways um, uh, in the Southwest and elsewhere. Mutual aid societies uh, are the essence of survival by a depressed or suppressed population, working class folk, rural populations that had little access to the resources of the state that ruled over them. The Liga Protectoras were an important part of the daily survival of the Henisoro populations. Uh, they were the source of loans whenever um, there, were, uh, there was need to carry out uh, rituals, for example, births, it always costs money to get a priest to baptize a baby, uh, or the death rituals, uh, burials and what all for church services, uh, health issues that had to be taken care of. This is where help came from, the Liga Protectora. These were mutual aid societies. Conflict resolution was an important part of that as well, as was the defense of those communities. It's often rumored, and it's, uh, it's rumored because of the 
kind of underground character of some of these institutions that had to go underground under the oppression that they felt through land encroachment from Euro America. So defense of the communities was an important part of the communal aspects that all that tied in religion, the, the mutual aid societies, and many of the communal institutions of the villages. Of course, the uh, religion was a very, very important part of the uh, life ways of, uh, of the uh, villages and villagers on a, on a daily basis. All of these characteristics um, are part of what we now see as the art and crafts of the Southwest that are so important in our, in our fairs. The moradas are, are reflective at the positioning, geographical positioning of uh, the moradas, the churches under the penitentiary religion are reflective of the oppression that uh, these Henisado populations experience. The Roman church condemned the uh, folk li life and folk ways of the penitente uh, practitioners and uh, forced them underground. They were forbidden to carry out these, mainly because Indians were declared by early decrees of the Roman Catholic Church going back to the 1400s that uh, Indians were um, to be Christianized. Uh, their humanity was even questioned. If you look at the debates between Bartolomé de las Casas and Sepulveda that occurred during the 1500s, uh, arguing this way and that way whether Indian people were actually people. And uh, this was, these debates ended up being the justification for enslavement, theft of lands, and all of that that went along with colonialism. people looking for economic opportunity coming out of villages like what was in northern New Mexico. Uh, this is my great great grandfather um, who came out of the uh, area just south uh, of the Chama River Valley as it flows northeast <coughs> near Santa Fe. Their uh, church records uh, and what all are based in Santa Fe. Uh, you talk about the, the confusion of identities that are caused by conquest and colonialism. Look at this man. He and his wife, um, Juana, Sal Juana Espinosa, Juana Espinosa is his wife. They, he was born uh, right around uh, 1870s. We're not absolutely sure that's not documented quite right. We just kind of a guess at it. But when he was born, the lands that, and the citizens that were living in northern New Mexico became Spanish, were Spanish citizens by, declare, by declaration of the king of Spain, right? It was Spanish for crown land. So that happened only until 1821, but his family was Espanolis, right? Uh, they were on the lower end of the hierarchy, of course, but. Uh, uh, they were citizens of Spain for six years. Mexican independence came in 1821. So you have a nation of Mexico that eliminated this, uh, Spain from the picture. So there's my grandmother and my grandfather living on the same piece of land, cultivating corn, beans, and squash, raising a few stock animals, and now they're Mexicans. 27 years later, after the U.S. instigated war against Mexico, taking 50% of their land, well, now they're Americanos. <laughs> Same family. <laughs> well, uh, but they, uh, they became citizens of, a, of another country. So this is just one little example of the confusion that arises within the context of conquest and colonialism. Uh, 
the life ways that I just uh, talked about were, was based on family labor. This is my mother's family. Um, and the, the, the guy, my great-great-grandfather, of course, is their grandfather and grandmother. Um, these are ten of, is that ten? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Yeah. That's ten of the eleven kids that my grandparents had. Um, are they native or are they Hispanic? If you raise that question among them, they're all gone now and we can't pass them anymore. But um, if they were to uh, be asked that question, I wonder if there would be any agreement as to what they felt about their history and about their identities as a consequence of that history. So it was Jose Ignacio Pacheco and Juana Espinosa, the progenitors of the move to Colorado. At a later age, and I would guess that the, my grand, great great grandmother had a lot of influence on the decision to make that migration, <coughs> just as we have seen that women are such an important part of the labor strikes that took place in the early part of the 20th century. Oftentimes it was the women who heard the cries of the children, and the hunger in their bellies and oil, that led people to the union strikes and then to other kinds of labor strike to try to improve the lives of people. But uh, this is where they came, uh, probably around 1870 or so. We're not, we haven't documented yet. It's in the 60s or the 70s, but it's right around that era that they came through, up through um, uh, Arroyo Hondo and Arroyo Seco in New Mexico, and then followed, I guess they must have taken a ride on I-25. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and came up into San Luis, and then later, because of land access, inaccessibility in, in uh, uh, the San Luis Valley, I would guess, they moved into Colorado. This family uh, represents uh, a small portion of the population looking for that uh, economic opportunity that was highly successful. The research that we have done into the history of my family, and especially Jose Ignacio, uh, Juana uh, Espinosa, and their kids. Francisco is my, my grandfather, and then his son is on uh, Armenio Pacheco, mm -hmm. my grandfather, my mother's dad. Uh, they were the essence of what an entrepreneur is. We wondered how in the world were they able, as Spanish speakers, to navigate an English-speaking world, a different legal system, and get access to the land that they got here. They started out in what is now called Mutual Camp, right, um, right outside of Walsinger. Um, they got access to land there, and from there, um, the, my great-grandfather, Francisco, and his two sons, uh, Aram and um, Armenio, they got into expanding their land holdings for the purpose of sheep grazing, uh, sheep ranching. And at one point, they owned almost 5,000 acres. A lot of this land that you see from uh, Silver Mountain all the way through Navajo, that used to be my grandparents' land. Uh, so, that was, that was a big instigator for people to make those migrations, whether they were remaining in New Mexico, moving from, from one region to another, setting up communities, or migrating at risk, great risk, into areas like the San Luis Valley. And as early as 1842, a lieutenant, a member of the uh, uh, military, the Spanish military, or the Mexican military, uh, tried to lead a colonization effort in the valley bringing several families with him as was required under the land grant system. He was driven out, that whole group was driven out of there uh, by Ute Indians. But it wasn't but a short time later, two decades later, my great great grandparents and their kids were on their way north up on I-25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's my great grandfather and his wife, Ignacita Duran, 
and their sons. This is uh, my grandfather on the right. He's he was killed on the mountain at their Silver Mountain in 1944 by lightning strike, mm -hmm. and that's where the family lost most of its land because he left without a will. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. That was supposed to have a lot of communities named on it, but somehow they got erased. Try the next one, Jim. Oh, I'll be down. I'm fancier than I thought. <laughs> One more, yeah. <laughs> this is the early 20th century, and I put this in to show where the Henisado population existed, along with their Native American brothers and sisters, uh, in the whole hierarchy of the Southwest. And when we talk about economic opportunity, we can see that my grand grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents were kind of an exception to the rule of what happened to many of the people that lived it, not only in northern New Mexico, but later migrated up into this region and also became part of the lower working class here in this county. So, um, well, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. I want to leave time for questions, so let's move on to the next. So here are some concluding questions. What's the importance of what I just went through? Um, there's been a proliferation of labels for the population of which my family is a part. Many of the people here in this county are part of this population that have been labeled in one way or another. It's a very confusing kind of situation uh, and leaves many of our younger people um, with an identity crisis. In my classes in ethnic studies at CSU, uh, a lot of the uh, Chicano kids that came into those classes, I better put a slash there and say Mexican American as well, because many of them had no idea what it means to be a Chicano. <laughs> so their identities are all confused, as mine was when I was born <coughs> too. <coughs> a brief story. When I sent off for my first uh, card, the Social Security card, and the government sent me my little card, white card with blue letters on it. It said, Norberto Valdez. And at that time, I wasn't Norberto, I was Norbert. And I took white out, symbolically. <laughs> <laughs> and he erased the O on my social security card. That was a strange thing, but that's what a colonized mind does. Right? I didn't think of it that way. I was just being worried. <laughs> and now look at you. <laughs> I stuck that old back on after I touched yeah. on the studies. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So um, all these labels are, you know, they're part of very intense debates. Yeah. And the people that whose original <laughs> uh, uh, homelands were in New Mexico, part of this any sort of phenomenon. Um, are a big part of that discussion. Um, the impacts of the 2020 census, that adds more confusion because there's, there's ethnic identities, there are racial identities as well, and uh, the populations that are called, quote, Latino or Hispanic, that's not a racial category. You find people of all different colors um, and body shapes, I guess, too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not a racial category, it's, a, it's an ethnic one. And so, oftentimes it's very difficult for people to grasp that difference. Um, what comes up in the next census is going to be very important because uh, the, the Latino and Hispanic population has, uh, I think, to some degree, consciously been undercounted, undercounted in past censuses. And as this population grows, sometimes rather rapidly, you know, we're close to uh, coming up on 19% uh, of the U.S. population. 
You know, listen to the debates when they talk about needing certain categories of voters to vote. Who are they talking about? People of color. Who are they talking about? The black population. The black population is about 14%. What happened to the one that's 18 to 19% of? Why are they not talking about them? Well, because they're conveniently forgotten. It's kind of like the, the concept of Henisaros. It's I'm talking about a renaissance now. The renaissance, they're at the bottom. Why? Because that identity has been suppressed for centuries. The Spanish made an effort, a specific effort, to eliminate that concept from their vocabulary. They wanted to pretend that they were not, they had not created a class system, a caste system, a virtual caste system, in which native people, Henisaros, their sisters and brothers, were at the bottom of the social hierarchy. They were the useful manual labor for the missions and for the uh, wealthy people, the ricos in New Mexico and elsewhere. The military, they were recruits for the military as well. Yeah. So again, the census and uh, all of this uh, uh, <coughs> confusion over labels and all of that tends to fractionate populations. That disempowers them because when it comes to voting time, well, they'd start to argue about this and that that's not quite as important as who they're uh, uh, potentially voting for. And so empowerment has become a tremendously important part of the discussion of identity within this broader population. I'd like to recommend, uh, lastly, that you pay attention, if you're still interested in uh, more, learning more about the Henisaro population, to look at a book coming out this month, I believe, by two New Mexico professors. Um, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Eric uh, Enrique Lamadrid. Enrique Lamadrid, and the other person is uh, Moises Gonzalez. Um, these two persons um, are very well versed in their uh, knowledge about the Henisaro population. Uh, have participated in recent conferences on the topic of that identity. And uh, uh, I think they're going to reflect a lot of the, uh, the dynamism of the debates going on about any set of identity. Well, that pretty much concludes it. Woo! Yeah. <laughs>
there's not much connection to Spain left. Yes. Could you elaborate a little more on um, what is Chicanismo? Okay, yes. Chicanismo is a concept that came out of the struggles of people of Mexican ancestry in the United States uh, going back to around the 1920s, uh, leading up to the great uh, um, expulsion of Mexican populations. Almost a million people of Mexican ancestry got thrown out of the country. Many of them were citizens, like some of my own ancestors from, uh, from New Mexico may have been part of it. Most of them were in Arizona or in California. But Chicanismo is a political or a politicized uh, uh, identity, a label that refers to people of Mexican ancestry, uh, as one person said recently, that has not been anglicized. So it's a person that has some pride in their origins. The other thing is, is that they reject that notion of emphasis, a need for emphasis on the Spanish ancestry of this particular group. They identify more with the Indian part. So the term Chicano is very, as I see it, is very closely related to the term Genisaro, which recognizes fully the Indian ancestry. Because I just recognize it as, you know, Jorge Gonzalez and yes. Denver and that whole movement mm -hmm. in the 70s. Yes, yes. Uh, these, this term, of course, precedes these leaders from the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Um, and it was a statement of self-empowerment. It was a statement of self-identity. Uh, many uh, of this population of Mexican ancestry uh, were heavily denigrated and oppressed in the Southwest. And they wanted to emerge from these. We look at uh, legal cases like the Sleepy Lagoon case in California. Uh, there are lots of legal cases that uh, this population uh, brought going back to the 30s and 40s on behalf of Chicano children, people like kids of Mexican descent, uh, that um, uh, were a direct result of the uh, directed attempt to keep kids from being educated and properly in schools. They put them in the worst conditions in the schools if they had schools. Um, and during this, the uh, pre-civil uh, rights days uh, in the 50s and 60s, the kids of Mexican descent were classified in the schools as white in order to avoid uh, integration. So they would say, if you put kids of Mexican descent with black kids, well, there's integration and you conveniently got Anglo-American kids, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a clever move. You know, my own birth certificate says I'm white. Well, that's a debatable thing mm -hmm. in terms of identity, right? Uh, but um, yeah, your, your question is a good one because it, uh, it is a term that is not, it was popularized during the, the 60s and 70s because of the civil rights movement, but it was not widely accepted, actually. And the activism, of course, was a big part of it, with Jose Ángel Gutiérrez in Texas leading the uh, La Raza Unida Party, the political party, he ran for president. Uh, that's part of the lost history of this, of this population. Uh, that Mexican-American population has often been portrayed as a sleeping giant. We hear that today in the newspapers, as if there's no activism going on. All they have to do is look at uh, politics in California, where a significant part of of the populated, the voting population is Mexican American, and they are dynamic there. It's just that there are other places, like where my family comes from, that's not so dy dynamic. But there are still strong currents of political activism there, as well as you see here in in um, in Colorado. Yes. I have a question. Have you um, ever looked at the works or ever met um, uh, Professor Devon Pena? Devon Penny? Penny? Sure, we tried to hire him. Really? <laughs> with Seattle. the SAPA Institute? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, he uh, he was important to me. I, I voted for him to hire him. <laughs> yeah, because he's, um, he's very uh, uh, knowledgeable about the Asequia system. Yes. He wrote a book 
about the lifeways based upon the communal institutions that I pointed out here. The Asequia system, he's a landowner there oh, in yeah. San Luis. Yes. Do you know him personally? I do. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've been on his property, both properties. Yeah, now. yeah. It's so special to me. Mm -hmm. and yes, yes. Have you met uh, Maria Valdez? I'm not and, sure. And her ex, who is a professor at New Mexico. I don't believe so, yeah. but Shirley Romero down in the yes, valley went. Yes, yeah. I went with all of them to um, Denver for mm -hmm. the land grant. Yeah, the hearings? Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, very good. Appreciate your interest in that. Yes, please. I have a question and a comment. Um, my first question is, what is the relationship between language and identity and labels? Yes. That you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, <clears throat> language, of course, is the, the bearer of culture. When the, one loses the language, you're interpreting the world around you through somebody else's screen, right? There's a filter there that tends to affect your way of seeing things and defining them. So it's important. It's important. And um, uh, when it, it pertains to labels, say the Chicano population, with its heavy emphasis upon Indianness, has kind of a contradictory position of also emphasizing the language of the colonizer, right? Spanish. <laughs> So that's part of the confusion uh, and the complexity, the nuances, right, of, of language, culture, and life experience. Yeah. And uh, the second thing, thank you for that. Um, I just want to point out, um, I lived in Virginia for many years. And oh, I'm sorry. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, hundred years ago, in relationship to identity and culture, a hundred years ago in Virginia, uh, an individual in the Vital Statistics Bureau decided that there could only be two types of people, white or black. And if you were Native American, you didn't exist. I know that because my husband was part Cherokee. And uh, so there were no schools for Native American children. There was no identity for that. And in the area of Virginia where we live, which was central Virginia, the tribes were not, the tribe, the Monacan tribe, was not recognized until 1986. Mm -hmm. So there was this huge history of suppression uh, for Native Americans mm -hmm. there as well. Yes, yes. That's, okay, yes. Art, third. Art, third. Uh, to your people have the same problem that we have as a result of the activism of the 70s. Yeah, as a result of what? 70s. Uh, activism. The activism of the 70s yeah. created Native American, for us Native Americans a problem where suddenly we had super Indians where prior to that they were, they never, what, uh, claimed their ancestry. Mm -hmm. But suddenly they the 1970s kicked in and all of a sudden we were all being judged as to whether we were fully Indians or not Indians, yes. simply because we didn't take part in the activism. Do you hear people have that problem? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and I think a, a lot of the failures of the Chicano movement were based not only on that part, that um, the radicalism of that movement was not embraced by a lot of uh, people of Mexican ancestry, but there was also this contradiction that they, it was very patriarchal and that it didn't include uh, women in the leadership of what was going on. If you look at the leadership of the Chicano movement, you see names like Corpio uh, Gonzalez or Jose Angel Gutierrez. And, uh, you can go right down the line, they're all men. And, and, and these were with the, uh, with the uh, uh, behaviors, uh, masculine behaviors that, uh, that are part of uh, the discussion about the Me Too movement and all of that. Right? So, yeah, the divisions there are uh, very much so. The, and, and from what I understand, at Pine Ridge, you've got uh, the, 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 the divisions between those that are more developmental, development oriented, economic development oriented, and those that are. <coughs> 
the so-called full bloods, right? There's, that's a major division. Did you want to address that part oh, of it? The other thing I want to know is that on a Pine Ridge we had the traditionals, then we had what we call the Yeskas, then we had those who were what the uh, more dominant culture oriented. But the Yeskas always had a problem because they were neither accepted by the Indians nor by the uh, Caucasians. Mm -hmm. So you had this middle class of people <clears throat> and they tended to either go believe that they were totally Indian or they were totally Caucasian or some other race. And basically, they were the ones that caused most of the problems between the groups because they were either, they were taking sides mm -hmm. and then demanding the people that they took sides with to go against the others. Yes. So you should have that problem. Early on in New Mexico, it became a major problem, especially as it came to economic class. Because the wealthy of New Mexico, the wealthy elite, are the folks who, uh, in the view of, uh, uh, from a Chicano viewpoint, they're the ones that sold out their own people. By in, they, seen, they saw the writing on the wall. The, the writing on the wall was about conquest leading up to the 1846 War of the United States. And many of them uh, found uh, ways especially through marriage, to, uh, uh, to uh, curry to their own favor, to their, their own benefit. Uh, people like the, um, let's see what's the name of them, uh, the family that Kit Carson married into. I can't remember their name. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Who's the bet family? Was it? Um, no. Oh, Josephine. Or native ones. Yeah. Yeah. It was an Hispano elite family. Yeah. Espinosa. Espinosa. No, no, no. <coughs> Josephina. Josephina. Yes, that's your first yeah. name. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, the the wealthy elite, the men, would oftentimes seek to marry their daughters off to uh, outsiders who would be, it was kind of a convenient economic marriage. And um, it resulted in. Uh, them uh, being able to, at least for a time, maintain access to their wealth, their properties, and all. Uh, so um, they were definitely looking outward. Uh, I didn't. I don't know if I, I'd have to look a little further into the history to to see whether or not they fell on one side under one issue and fell on another side uh, on another issue. Uh, but um, I imagine that happened also. Yes. Yeah, tabling the uh, details and specifics of your presentation, would you say that this story has repeated itself worldwide? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think without doubt. <clears throat> yeah. This is where I think uh, my anthropological training, uh, uh, I've learned a lot about what uh, happens when um, there are issues of colonialism, direct or indirect political uh, domination of a population at uh, an ethnic group level as well as at a national level. Uh, the use of politics, the taking of land and resources, um, the forced migration of populations, enslavement, all of that that comes into play in various parts of the world. Yes. Can you think of examples to the contrary? Where there has been equality and fairness? <laughs> <laughs> well, all we have to do is bring up the gender issue and that strikes that one down. Uh, oh, I have to think hard. Yeah, I doubt if I'd come up with something that, that could serve as a model or <laughs> Yeah, Are you, do you have something in mind? No, no, I was curious. <laughs> You'd be in trouble. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of people that claim to be heavy in blood, and you look at them and you go, like, you know, like, sort of a, like Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and, you know, I, I, re, I also I took the uh, 23andMe uh, 
genetics. I'm from northern New Mexico, and I thought Apache background, and I thought for sure I was 50 percent plus. Being American, I was only 26. So I was really disappointed. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, but I was just that got me to thinking about are there are there criteria out there or, or uh, um, about how much Indian blood you have to have to receive certain benefits, let's say, whether it be money, fishing rights, or college scholarships. Is there anything out there at all about like that? There is no consistency on that. It's very arbitrary, just like racial categories are very arbitrary based on nothing. Skin color is only skin deep. And uh, look at what it's done to world affairs. Mm -hmm. Everything from unjust wars to enslavement to affected lands and what on. So, the census, and talking about the, the unfairness of it and the confusion that it causes, it was perpetrated as a political tool to deprive Indians of their land. You could define them out of existence. This is partly why, not just beyond the issue of disease and warfare, they were defined, many of them were defined out of existence through the census, census categories. The issue of skin color, uh, well, among the Hispanic po uh, uh, population, the, and these sort of population, uh, you find uh, dark-skinned persons all the way across the spectrum to blonde, blue-eyed folks. Your great-great-grandfather so, looked very blonde in the picture. Yeah, that's what leads some of my relatives to say, "Oh, that's you know, my my grandfather himself, uh, Manuel, had a red mustache, and his daughter is uh, had red hair, and so." Characteristics like that, which are very super, uh, superficial when it comes to a scientific analysis of skin color, and hair texture, lip shape, and all of those kind of characteristics that are typically part of the package that supposedly gets transferred between and among individuals within a race. Uh, it's, it's, it's all. Uh, Isn't it interesting our blood's all, all the same color? I'm sorry? Isn't it interesting that our blood all the same color? So we're all brothers and sisters. Another question I have is, uh, do you have problems with movies like uh, 1967? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, I haven't seen that movie. <laughs> Where it's all the, uh, the uh, white gunmen come in and stay the next Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that was out of yeah. It's kind of like, um, the guy and dances with wolves, right? Mm -hmm. Same yeah, thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's Hollywood for you. Mm -hmm. yeah, Hollywood is a very political place. And um, it serves the interests of those that make the films. It's kind of like the writers of books. Those that write them uh, oftentimes are not from the subaltern group, as you're called, but the other. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, oh. Many years ago, I lived in Albuquerque. I'm going to say probably 55 years ago, 60 years ago, and I took conversation with Spanish. I moved from the East Coast to Albuquerque. And I uh, took conversation with Spanish, and I can remember hearing this, this tale that in northern New Mexico, there were a lot of Mexicans, Mexican Americans, that were freckled and redheaded. And it was attributed to an Irish priest that was. Have you heard anything? I've heard of Padre Martinez, but not this. <laughs> but there's an aspect of New Mexico history that is connected to the Irish. Yes, I know. Uh, have you heard of the San Patricios? There's a documentary about a uh, you know, the, pr leading up to the uh, war of the United States against Mexico in 1846, um, that was around the time of massive Irish migration to the United States because of family conditions there under the British, right? Yeah. Yeah. Caused by the British, the, the, the silos were full of grain, and there was food, ample food, to stop the killing of Irish people through starvation. Well, when they migrated here, 
they couldn't all fit into Lowell, Massachusetts factories. Right? <laughs> so where did they go? A lot of them, were, as kids, were put on trains and shipped out to Nebraska farmers, right? They did that with orphans. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so there's a lot of craziness that went on there. Why? Because at that time, Irish were defined as black. They were not white. And this is part of the colonial attitudes of the British there. They learned this crap long before they came over this way. They brought a bit of water, right? But the San Patricios, to get back to the original point, um, a war came along, and here's these sometimes idle Irish people who <coughs> had a job, right? And so they were recruited into the military. A lot of them went to New Mexico and later into Old Mexico, right? Well, there had already been Irish people there, and there was already at that time an Irish military person in the Mexican army, how he got there, I don't know that story, but he began to send little messages through his spies into the uh, American forces, telling them, what are you doing fighting for those guys uh, of British ancestry that are the story behind why you're here in this part of the world? You're fighting against Catholics when Protestants did things to you over there? Uh, and they're right there in your, your army, your, your fellow soldiers. Why don't you come over on our side where there's Catholics and there's people fighting against your oppressor <laughs> across the big water? And 300 and some left the military and went on the other side. A whole bunch of them. Yeah. Now they lost the war, right? On that side of the border. They lost the war. So there was uh, specific animosity directed at those soldiers who, who uh, left, the, they, they went, they stripped them naked, marched them through Mexico City. Many of them were hung. Uh, some of them were tattooed. This is not a, a German, only a German thing. They were tattooed and other kinds of atrocities were committed against them. Uh, they have a, an annual get-together. Emissaries are sent from Mexico to Ireland. Next year, Ireland sends its emissaries to Mexico to celebrate that, that commonality that historical event. Mm -hmm. Yes, Yeah. Oh, just uh, related to the question where I thought the question was going. But uh, the uh, one thing about nor northern New Mexico, you often hear, uh, I began to hear when I was hired at the University of New Mexico, that the, uh, the dialect of Spanish that was spoken had lots of archaic expressions in it, you know. And, um, I uh, lived on a ranch uh, while I was working at the university, and I would participate in the cleaning of the acequias with a local community. I'd right? go out there, and um, my my second language is Portuguese, and the, the Lego Portuguese, Portuguese, and uh, it's like the, the language spoken in Galicia, which is just north of Portugal on the Iberian Peninsula, and there are plenty of red-haired uh, you know, people up there. But the thing is, so I'm there working my shovel and cleaning the acequia, and um, this elder in the community, Ted Esquivel, asks his helper, his hired hand, uh, in, in Spanish, quote unquote, give me the shovel. And, you know, in Spanish, say, dame la pala. But he didn't say that. He said, dame la pala. <laughs> I mean, that's Gallego he must or be Portuguese. <laughs> no, no, it's Portuguese. It's Portuguese. <laughs> or Gallego. You know, so, mm -hmm. I, and there are a lot of archaic, you know, if I look at the old writings, uh, like some of the Ansa, the writings during the Ansa period in New Mexico and, mm -hmm. and uh, people there before him, there are a lot of archaic expressions in the Spanish. Yes. Yeah, and that uh, is partly why um, many people in New Mexico and here on this side of the border claim that there's a direct connection in their trees to, to the Spanish because there are these cultural characteristics such as language that they share. Mm -hmm. You know, my, you know, my own family <coughs> counted money in reales. Mm -hmm. Un real is yeah. what? Twelve and a half cents. Mm -hmm. Dos reales is a quarter. 
Cuatro reales is a buck, right? It's a peso. Yeah. It wasn't dollar, it's a peso. <laughs> that's all Spanish stuff. So that's just one little yeah. example of the ar archaic uh, yeah. aspects of the Spanish language that are still preserved today. Yeah. And so it, it gives kind of um, an impetus, I guess, to people who want to claim that Spanish yeah. ancestry to, to continue with that kind of thing. Okay, anyone else? Yes, yeah, Sandy. If you guys are interested in this, and obviously you are, because I think there's about 35 of you here, <laughs> we've got a wealth of stuff and people that we could bring to do more of this. So let us know what you're interested in. You know, and the whole Wadley Heritage Foundation thing is cultural equity. Is that ever going to occur? Probably not, but we can work towards it. And this is part of this cultural equity project or, or belief or vision or goal, whatever, Don Quixote, <laughs> you know, so, but Arthur or me or Norberto or any of us, and if you're interested in being part of our heritage, or Anna Jo, my AJ, you know, any of us that are involved in this really want to see this grow and, and continue these kinds of conversations, and we're putting on our traditions health, health fair, that's my last lifetime. Art. <laughs> uh, craft, art and craft fair this weekend at the Mercantile. You know, I'm all about folk art, and that's that's my greatest level of all this. But I'm just fascinated, and I think we can put on some really interesting programs. We can be bringing some documentaries in. But let us know what you want. Yeah. Thank There's you a, for bringing that to the community. Yeah, your uh, point about what the goals of this uh, uh, Latoya Heritage Foundation are is is directly tied to what one aspect of this presentation is about, and that is revealing a suppressed history. Right? So uh, the history of Warfield County isn't that well known widely, I'd say for those of us that like to read books and, uh, and um, shoot the bull with people in the library. Um, well, well we, we might learn a little bit more about it, but oftentimes the, the history, for example, that of Anisaros, uh, is is a, a hidden history that the Hanisado people themselves know that they've lived it in wide open spaces, but it's either suppressed, ignored, or just forgotten. And this is the essence of these different kinds of uh, studies that we uh, find in university campuses, like ethnic studies or Chicano studies, Indian studies, that point us to bring up uh, issues of these different populations whose histories have been suppressed over time. I thought of him. Yeah, hi. And that's why we know as West Hamilton County, the Orphan County. They were often forgotten. Many aspects. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's as if we don't count, right? Yeah. And that includes all of us, so we should all be concerned about this suppression of history. Yes, please. Really, when you brought up the whole DNA thing, and I have, I mean, as much as I really wish the DNA test was the silver bullet to identify my origin, isn't it only as good as how much has been collected? Um, as far as I've heard of a person, many people, sending it into different companies and getting different results from all the companies, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I wish it was just like, yay, you know, but... You no, know, you're right. It, you get different results from different companies. The certain populations are grossly underrepresented in those databases. So give it a big grain of salt. They're getting better, but um, I don't take them very seriously yet. And are you going to do us another program on that? <laughs> please, oh please! <laughs> so oh, please! <laughs> She's a molecular geneticist, so she knows this. Oh, there you go. Yes. Well, that's a good point. You know, we, we've gotten into this a little bit. Um, she knows a lot more about it than I do. But there are different levels of analysis that you can do from the same company, uh, doing a deeper and more widespread analysis of the material that we keep to us from our ancestors. Yeah, which comes in importantly, uh, at least from what we have found in that, it sure demonstrates how the randomness of genetic 
uh, transference of um, or transmission of uh, uh, genetic material is. Uh, the redness in somebody's hair, for instance, could have gone back several generations and all of a sudden it shows up. Or some other characteristic. Right? Um, the, uh, say, within the same household, uh, an African, say, two or three percent of an African constitution may be evident in one of the siblings but not in another within the same family. It speaks to that issue of the randomness of that transfer, right? Yes. Uh, based on what you just said, I uh, some years ago when I returned to Colorado after living all over the world, I got a gig in San Luis with the Aseke Association. And I was Does everybody know what the Aseke is? Aseke, it, it's, a, it's an Arabic word. Actually, that refers to the ditches, irrigation ditches, that were a reflection of old world agricultural practices as well as the extensive agricultural and irrigation systems of the San Luis. And very important to the settlement of this yes. entire area. And San Luis is the only existing Aseca left in the United States. So, but anyway, my, what came to mind when she was explaining that uh, was that. If, so I, I got all the Asakia uh, people together, and I set the room up in a circle. And and I'm from Colorado, and I've got <clears throat> blondes and blue-eyed people throughout both of my, you know, both my parents. And I'm standing there, and every single Asakia uh, member, every one of them, blue or green eyes. I was the only one with brown eyes. So that was something, you know, enlightenment for me. So, I mean, we're all related, <laughs> you know, somehow. Because it's and we still have some good connections with San Luis and the Sakia people, but we could do, I wanted to do a program, and um, Grim Eugene Hawk is up here, who's, I think, the president of the association down there yes. and is willing to come yeah. and do a program on the Asakias. If you guys are in, oh, it's, 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 it's fascinating. I, um, well, what, what we did with the project that I was working on is we created a video explaining the, uh, the history of the Asekias. Yeah, there's a book called Asekia Culture, if you're interested. Yeah. 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 I, I think I, sh I, I left you have that video. I mean, I just... Not the video. The video? Oh, I thought that was in one of the ones I... No, I just have the book. So oh, okay. Books. Well, I do have the Asekia uh, video if you want as a result of that. But that to me, and here I am, a native Coloradoan, and I'm just looking around and I'm not questioning it, I was just fascinated. I mean, it was all, you know, and then, uh, as I say, my own family, my daughter's blue-eyed and my son's got the darkest, you know, brown, black eyes ever, so who knows? Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I noticed on the uh, screen there is the Martinez family and the ha Hacienda concept of, of grouping people or in those types of settlements. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to the Martinez Hacienda South of Taos? No, I haven't. No. Is that uh, Rancho de Taos? No, Taos. Taos, Taos. Taos itself. Uh -huh. no. South of Taos. Mm -hmm. No, I haven't been there. We, we were there several years ago, and uh, there's a few old ladies in there on old rooms weaving. Yeah. And uh, we took time and spoke mm -hmm. with, with one of them, who was a direct descendant of the Martinez family. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting that the rooms. Years ago, I told my wife was in, but it was a manufactured room. And uh, these were parts of trees, some still had bark on them, and then mm -hmm. just. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, bet we could even organize a little field trip down to San Luis. Eugene would welcome us. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. How many of you are interested in it? 